We're not going to read all of this again tonight. This is the account of the prodigal son, and uh, we want to just uh, use it as a beginning spot and then uh, see some things as we go along. It says in verse 11 of Luke chapter 15, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Uh, the next verses talk about how a famine arose in the land, his money was all squandered and gone, and he ends up attaching himself for, as a hireling uh, with a man who owns hogs. And so he is feeding the hogs, living with them, and basically starving to death to the point where he's actually looking with hunger at what he's feeding the pigs. And, uh, and realizes that uh, he's been wrong, he has sinned. Uh, it says he came to himself, which is an indicator that the term we would use is he, he finally wised up, the light bulb came on. You can phrase it in any number of ways. But he recognized that he had sinned against God, sinned against his father, and so he went home. And uh, as he was walking towards the house, uh, he knew what he was going to say to his dad. He was going to, again, admit his wrongdoing, uh, confess his repentance uh, before God and his father, and uh, ask that he could be just as a hired servant. His father saw him coming, ran to him, uh, and uh, didn't castigate him, but rather ran to him and hugged him and gave him a kiss and, and ordered that he... Uh, get uh, fine robes and rings and shoes for his feet, uh, things that are normally not given to strangers, uh, and, uh, but rather as a mark of being a member of the family, and to kill the fatted calf, and, and they would have a, a party. They would make merry, as it says. And so they were doing that. The older brother, uh, who never left, uh, was put out by it. Uh, we know that, and, and uh, he wouldn't go into the party. Uh, his father came out to him and asked him why, and, and he said, you know, I've never sinned against you. I've always been with you. I've never transgressed all your commandments, and you never threw a party for me. Uh, you never killed a fatted calf for me and my friends. And his father explained to him that your brother was dead, and now he's alive. And uh, so it made sense that they would do that. I find it interesting, I was reading over this again today, uh, yesterday and today, and you know what? We, we, we never see a response from that other brother. Did you ever notice that? The other brother never says, you know, Dad, you're right. And, uh, you know, Dad, I, I was thinking wrongly. And, and you know what, Dad, I, you know, please forgive me because I wasn't handling this right. We never see that. Uh, and, and I don't want to read into it. I don't want to over-speculate. Uh, it could be because... Uh, God just didn't see the need to show us that. It could be because there was no repentance on his part. Uh, he may have dug in his heels. What relationship he had with his brother after that, we don't know. And that really is not the gist of the story. But what we see here is one, and you'll recall last week we talked about the, the, the definitive difference between a prodigal and somebody who is wayward. And so if you look at your outline, your introduction, we touch on that. In fact, some of it we have repeated uh, from last week. But we began last week looking at the matter of wayward children. And as I'd mentioned last week, I've had some ask me if we could handle this uh, through the course of this study in the summertime on a family. And so we looked last week, this week, at least next week, and we'll see uh, how much we get in then uh, to, to deal with this particular topic. Our text on a prodigal son was examined insofar as the events, the consequences for sin, uh, et cetera, as we talked about just a moment ago. As we saw last week in our introduction, uh, it's not a rarity that Christian families have children who have gone to the world. Uh, some have gone to the world uh, and in doing so have recanted any supposed faith. Um, just to interject, I was reading an article today. Uh, it was a book review uh, about uh, uh, somebody who had written a book uh, just a new book, it's just out, and, uh, and the, the reviewer suggested that we get it and read it. By the time I read the article, I didn't want to read the book. Um, you know, do you ever read a book and you feel like you need to take a shower when you're done reading it? And I kind of felt that way just reading the review. Uh, and what it is about, just to capsulize it, 
It's written by somebody who went to a Christian college um, and uh, grew up in a church like ours. They used the term fundamentalist quite a bit uh, and talked about how they now are very openly and actively living the gay lifestyle and feel liberated. And they used, I believe, if I remember correctly, nine different accounts. And what amazed me was that they give their names. And their names are in the book, so this guy gave the names in the, in the, uh, uh, in the review. And uh, looking at that, and I thought, how torturous that must be if parents see that. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but almost, in fact, maybe each one. And, uh, and if not each one, then almost each one. Uh, talked about, and they all had the same, grew up in a, in a fundamentalist home, grew up in a Bible-believing church, went to a, a, a Christian college, and, uh, and, and almost from the time they got to the college, they, they put up a, a fence against the rules, and, and they talk about how hypocritical they were and, and how they twisted Scripture and and so uh, in each one, and all of them professed to be gay. Uh, one fellow uh, graduated from this college with a degree in Bible, uh, actually was in the ministry as a youth pastor. Uh, he and his wife divorced. Uh, another fellow who was in the book, uh, similar circumstance, similar accounting. Now, I'm using the terminology of the world here, but that first one who he and his wife were divorced, he was in the ministry. The second one was in the ministry. He and his wife were divorced. Those two men now are married, and the first one pastors a church in a liberal denomination. And all of them talk about how liberating it was. Now listen to this. How liberating it was when they stopped reading the Bible literally. In other words, they felt liberated because they looked at the Bible and said, well, it doesn't mean this. And a couple of them actually said, I, I don't even believe it anymore. And a couple of them went so far as to say, I'm, I'm an agnostic and maybe even closer to an atheist at this point. At the same token, some of them said, you know, I, 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 I don't look at those passages in the scripture uh, concerning the sin of homosexuality. Uh, they call them, I'd never heard this term before, they call them the clobber passages. And what they mean by that is people use these passages to clobber us. And so that's how they refer to them. And, and they, all of them said, we came to realize that, you know, and some using terms like God made me this way and therefore it's okay and I don't have to worry about the clobber passages anymore and I don't take the Bible literally, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, reading through it, it was very clear, and not reading a book, but just a review, it was very clear that every one of them was basically rebelling against God. Ergo, they're rebelling against God's word. And the next step to that is you rebel against any standard that God has in any respect. And so marriage, uh, relationships, faithfulness, belief and adherence to the word of God, all that went out the window so that they could say, now I feel much better about myself. Now I'm happy with myself. Now I feel free. And it's tragic. It's tragic. This book, the writer and the nine people that he includes in the book, you're talking about ten people. That is exponentially multiplied. Maybe not with that particular sin, but with the idea that, okay, this is how I grew up, this is what I was always taught, I've rejected that, I'm going to do my own thing, I'm going to go do what I want to do. And that is the case that we're looking at here as we look at wayward children. Looking back here at this paragraph, uh, again, some have recanted uh, supposed faith. What lies in the path of those events are broken hearts, soul-searching struggles with why, and the question that still looms is what do we do now? What often adds to the baffling aspect, and this is from last week's intro, and we just brought it in verbatim, uh, of dealing with this kind of situation is when siblings of the wayward one, raised in the same home, raised in the same church, raised with the same patterns, and the siblings have a heart for God, and the siblings seek 
to serve and to please God with all their lives. And so you've got child A and child B that sat at the same kitchen table eating dinner all those years. They had the same disciplinary pattern in their homes. They had, they had the same church situation. And so the, the child A has a heart for God and stays faithful, and, and child B turns his back on it all and goes the other way. But we have that in the case of the prodigal son. Again, we talked about last week how that other brother was pretty much pharisaical in his attitude. Uh, I never did this, I never did that, but you've never done this for me. But the fact is, is that he stayed, and he was faithful to his father and faithful to the work that was there, and he stayed. He didn't take the money and go and squander it like his other brother had done. And so we also then last week defined the difference between prodigal and wayward. Uh, we often think that they mean the same thing. Prodigal means somebody who takes everything they have and wastes it, uh, be it money, possessions, anything. They just go and they waste it all. They just tear through it. Where somebody who's wayward is somebody who has demonstrated a rebellious heart, uh, a, a, a desire and an exercised desire not to be in, under any control, to do what they want to do no matter what anybody else says. And if anybody disagrees with them, then the person disagreeing with them is the one who is wrong. That's why I used the illustration of that book review I read, because here you have these 10 people accounted for in the book, the author and nine others, who look at all the passages in the scriptures that tell us that homosexuality is a sin, and they have said in essence, though none of them said these words, but in essence they've said, the Bible's not gonna have any control over me or any control over anything that I want to do. That's wayward. Now it may not be the same exact pattern of following in every life, but that's the difference between a prodigal and a wayward child, and we're talking about the wayward ones. In this lesson, we're going to look at the question, why? Why? Why did this happen? Along with that question comes the question, what did we do wrong? And then in the following lesson, we'll look at what do we do now? Let me preface here, and this isn't in your notes, but when we look at the question as to why, that's not always it's not always possible to definitively answer that question. Because we look and we say, well, why did this happen? We don't know. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we can put a finger on it. We're going to address some things tonight that may be reasons why. But again, as we look at these things that may be reasons why, we know of others who grew up with those reasons evident in their homes, and they didn't run away from God. They didn't turn their back and dive into sin. And then the other question that we talk about here is, what did we do wrong? And as I go through this tonight, please understand that this is, because some of these things are, are, are kind of hard, but they're not an indictment. It's not saying, well, if you have a child that's turned their back on the things of God, this is what you did wrong. Okay? Because you may not have done these things. And you'll see that as we come to the close as to ultimately why that has happened. Okay? But if we see things, and we'll talk more about this next week, what do we do now? Is as we go through some of these things and we look and we say, yeah, you know, that, that's true. That, and, I, and I was, I'm not going to say guilty, but, but that fits me. Well, then what do we do about it? Just like anything else that's wrong in our life, we repent of it. And we ask God to forgive us for it, and he will. And if we can ask forgiveness of somebody who's been affected by it, we should. Okay. And so, as we look at these things tonight and walk through it, uh, they're, they're not pleasant, but they're real. And so let's take some looks. Why, why do Christian children become wayward? Why do Christian children become wayward? This obviously has been on my mind the last couple of weeks as we put these lessons together. And, and Monday morning, I drove over to see the kids off to camp. I do that every year. It was kind of funny Monday morning because I always come and pray with them. And so Mark DeBruler was taking care of everything and saying, okay, everybody, here's what I want you to do. Find your seat on the bus. Everybody go to the bathroom, then get on the bus, or on the, on the vans, rather, and you can spread out a little bit. We've got a little extra room, so we don't have to have 15 in one van and, 
and six in another, so kind of spread around. And, but the junior boys are all riding in this van. That was a smart move there, uh, especially if he wasn't driving that van. But, but, uh, but we're going to put all of them here, and this is the way we're going to do it. And he said, now we're going to pray, and then I want you to find your seat in the, in the van, then go to the restroom, and we'll get ready to go. And he said, so let's pray, and he prayed. And he said to me afterwards, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I, I knew you were here to pray. And so I just told him, I said, that's all right, I've got it written out, and I'll use it next year. Okay? <laughs> but in all seriousness, I, I was standing there the other morning, and I was looking at all those kids that were going, 28 kids, 28 or 29 kids that, that left on Monday morning and are at the Wilds this week. And I looked at each one of them as best I could, and just kind of walk, looking at them in mass some of the times, but sometimes individually, and wondering, where are they going to be 10 years from now? That's how I prayed for them this week, that God will grip their heart now. And, and I've heard others pray the same way, that, that they'll make lifelong and life-changing decisions to follow God. And we pray that way for the kids here. We pray this way for our grandchildren, that they'll have a heart for God. But I looked at them and I thought, because over the years, I mean, we've, we've been at this a couple of years, and uh, over the years, we've taken, we used to take kids to camp every year. And kids that would be there, and they would be gung-ho, and they'd have a time of their life. And three or four years out of high school, they never darkened the door of a church. And so I think the question why, if it can be a remedy to talk about some of these things, I think we should do so. So why do Christian children become wayward? And remember here, we're talking about Christian children or children out of Christian homes. We're not talking about the world. One last sidebar before we get into it. Understand, lost people in the world are going to act like lost people in the world. Okay? That's because that's what they are. What's that? Which ones? Ones we're talking about? Yeah, but what I'm talking about is these kids have come up we're talking about those who have come up in families where mom and dad are Christians and they've been in church. That's what we're talking about. No, no, no. I understand that, Charlie. What I'm saying, though, is that when we see the world's kids acting that way, it's normal and natural for them. Why is it happening in our families that are trying to raise their children for the glory of God? That's what we're talking about. I'm not saying they're... What's that? <laughs> no, just, just understand what we're talking about here is we're talking about Christian parents who are facing the hardship of having children who have walked away from God. And what I'm saying about the world's children is that that's, that's all they know. That's what they're going to do. Why is it that, that children in homes where they've been taught the Bible and they've been in church why are they departing? That's what we're dealing with. I'm not saying these kids that walk away and are wayward, I'm not saying that they're saved, okay? And I'm not saying that if they weren't wayward, they would be saved because of that. But I'm talking about when parents look and they say, what, the question is, why did this happen and what did we do wrong? That's what we're looking at. Jordan? I was just going to say, say, as far as the answers to why, you know, there's probably many answers, but I was just thinking of, like, other influences outside. You know, right, and that's some of the things we're going to look at tonight, Okay. So we see the first one we look at, neglect of parental roles. Neglect of parental roles. And so understand that as parents, we are to train our children for the glory of God. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the, word, of, of, of the Lord. And that is addressed to fathers. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. And so the instruction there is from the time they're wee little kids is that we begin to teach them and train them in the things of God. And again, understand that, that, that rules are important. We're not talking so much right here about rules and regulations. We're talking about dealing with their heart. And, and there are times when parents in Christian homes, they neglect this. Now, they don't, they don't purposely, they don't say, eh, I don't care, I'm not going to do that. But sometimes we allow the busyness of life, sometimes we allow the issues of life, uh, sometimes we allow other factors, some of which we'll touch on tonight. We allow those things to interfere 
and we end up neglecting the most valuable role that we have. Society teaches that the most important role somebody has is not being a parent, but it's, it's making themselves happy or having some other form of satisfaction or some such thing like that. And so when we look at this, we see one of the wise is neglect of parental roles. Are we training our children to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Are we training our children in the things of God? Or are we falsely assuming that, that well, you know, we, we, we have certain things that are not in our home and other things that are good that are in our home and we go to church all the time and so that's satisfactory. And that neglects the parental role. We'll see that as we go along. But in this same idea, understand that we're to be parents, not pals. Okay? We're to be parents and not pals. First Samuel chapter 3, we understand the situation with Eli, and we're told that Eli never disciplined his children. He, he never dealt with their sin. He never dealt with their corruption. He never dealt with it. And as a result, they had no heart for God. But I think probably, and, and, and I say this with some speculation, but I think probably to some degree, what you deal with with a Samuel is what we see in other people's lives, that they don't want to make their children angry. Have you ever been around somebody who actually is like they're afraid of their children? Because if I tell them no, they're going to get mad at me. If I tell them no, they're not going to like me. If I put parameters around their life, they're not going to be happy, and I'm going to be the bad guy. But God didn't call us to be their pals. He called us to be their parents. And he gave us that responsibility. And if we neglect the parental roles, then disaster is going to loom. Our son now is 42 years old. Adam and I are friends. I'm still dad. He's still my son. There are still times when those lines and those barriers don't break down. But at this point, I'm his friend. When he was 12, we got along great. But I was dad and he was son. And I wasn't so concerned about whether or not every instant of every day and every decision, he liked it and was happy with it. Okay? Uh, so there's a neglect of parental rules, or roles rather. Secondly, we, we see, and we're going to move through these, but we see that sometimes in parents, uh, again, Christian parents, there are unreasonable expectations. Now, I don't mean that we're telling our kids to do something that is... Uh, uh, you know, like, like go out and crawl through glass. Uh, I'm not saying things like that. But there are unreasonable expectations. And what you see with that, sometimes this comes into play. The matter of pride comes into play. It can take two forms. We've listed one. Uh, you will do this. You will act this way. Because if you don't, it will make me look bad. And so the concern with training is not so much to deal with their heart. It's to deal with the outward look so that people don't think poorly of us. Now that's one aspect of that pride issue. What would be the other side of that coin? If you do well, if you do act this way, if you do do the things you're supposed to do, then it makes me look good. It makes me look good. And so pride enters in in the sense that we're concerned about what other people think about us as a parent rather than being concerned with the heart of our child. And so those unreasonable expectations come into play in a matter of pride. The second thing that you see here, uh, th there's a living vicariously through our children. This, this can run a number of gamuts, and we don't have time to explore them all tonight. We've got here a little quote, I always wanted to do this and couldn't, so my child will. And that might be something like playing the piano. It might be something like going to a Christian school. It might be something like going to camp every summer or some such thing like that. But it also can be things like uh, my child is going to do what I always wanted to do and sometimes that opens the floodgates to wrongdoing. 
I was never allowed to do this when I was a kid, so I'm not going to tell my parents or my children no. Uh, I'm going to live vicariously through them. They're, they're going to get to do what I was always deprived of. It might be a case of we always struggled when I was coming up, and, and we had financial struggles, and, and uh, things were nip and tuck, and, and, and I don't want that for my child. It might be while my child was coming up, it was that way. So I want my child to follow the, the, the pathway that will give them a superior income and give them all the trappings of the world that we were never able to afford, and they're able to do this and do that, and there's a vicarious living. Those are unreasonable expectations. When we have those kinds of expectations, we take God clear out of the picture. We, we, we demonstrate that we're not thankful for what God has placed in our lives, and so we're going to try to correct that in our children's lives so that they won't be unthankful too. We see as well with that Proverbs 22, 6, which we've mentioned already, train up a child, and it says, in the way he should go. In the way he should go. And I emphasize the word he, and it could be she, but it's in, in the way that God has planned for the child. And our role is to train them so that that can be accomplished. Our role is to train them so that those things can be seen. And again, as we've talked about in the past, that makes it incumbent upon us to know our child, to know their strengths, to know their weaknesses, to know the bent that they have, and to train them in the way that God has for them. And you know what? God's way for our children may not be the way God had for us. God's way for our children, maybe it was what God really had in mind for us, but we never fulfilled it. There are all kinds of things that come into play here. But the idea that my child's going to do better and bigger and richer and more famous and all those other things than anything I was able, able to do, or good things, I never did that, but they're going to do it and I'm going to make sure they do, and they're going to be first in their class and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And that vicarious living is really an unreasonable expectation. We need to love our children the way God made them and understand them and train them for what God has for them in the future. And the key to that, again, as we've said many times, is to train their heart, to reach their heart. Because if their heart's not reached, they can play all the games on the surface. They can go through all the motions and everything can look good. But eventually that's going to wear away. Okay. We see the next point here is sometimes there's a lack of monitoring. And this is very important. It's very important. No, not that the others aren't, but this is very important. And this has been the open door to the demise of many a young person. There's a lack of monitoring. We just listed some things. A lack of monitoring friends. Most of you know Debbie's testimony. She grew up in a very, very bad home, uh, dysfunctional home. Uh, father was a violent alcoholic. <laughs> Uh, there was no place for the Lord in the home. But you know, Debbie's mom had a knack of making sure that Debbie wasn't around the wrong people. And there was one girl that we went to school with, we graduated with, and, and she lived near Debbie uh, and through junior high years. And Debbie and this girl, her name was Kathy, and they were friends. But Kathy started going down the wrong path. And Debbie's mom said to Debbie, you're not going to run around with Kathy anymore. You can't go to her house. You can't go places with her anymore. Because what I'm seeing in her, she's going down a wrong route. Now again, considering the home Debbie came out of, that was quite an observation. But if a lost mother in a bad home can see that kind of thing, Shouldn't we? We need to monitor our children's friends. We cite two verses here. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 8 through 11. Somebody wants to look at that real quick. Uh, and then also 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Somebody have 1 Kings 12, 8 through 11. Somebody? 
Go ahead, Jordan. Okay, and what we find there is Solomon's son. He's now the king. The older men advised him, and they said, here's how you should handle the people. So who does he talk to? He talks to his friends. He talks to the younger guys with whom he grew up. And they basically say, no, forget that. Here's what you need to do instead. And he follows their advice. And he's with friends who lead him down a primrose path. And all of Israel suffers because of it. First Corinthians fifteen thirty three. Somebody have that? Paul, go ahead. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Okay, and communications there really is talking about uh, relationships, friends uh, that, and it and it corrupts. Evil friends corrupt. Okay, don't be afraid. And those of you who are raising children, and and all of us should realize this. We shouldn't be afraid to say to our children, no, you can't go there. No, you can't go to their house. No, you can't go with them. They're going here, but you're not allowed to go. And it's a protective thing. And, and yet, again, there's a lack of monitoring on that that is disastrous. The second one we see, and this is unique to this day and age, a lack of monitoring technology. Psalm 101.3, David said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. But there's no monitoring of technology. We have children today, and I call them children because they're still children, but they may be 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. They have free and unfettered use of a cell phone. They have free and unfettered use of the internet on that cell phone. They have those capabilities on a computer or an iPad at home. And they look at anything they want to look at and they look and they read anything they want to read, and they communicate any way they want to communicate. When I was talking earlier about those nine or ten people in that book that I referenced, every single one of them said that their problems started with pornography. Every single one of them. And in our day and age, it is long past when we were kids and somebody wanted pornography and they had to go to a, 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 a sleazier part of town and go into a store that sold it now it's at the fingertips. And parents don't monitor those things. They leave them unchecked. We used to say this about cable television, and I still would say that, but that is so far down the line anymore as far as what all is available to our children and our grandchildren, and it goes unfettered. I know our, our son, uh, they have their oldest daughter is 15, and they finally got her a phone. But the phone is only available for her to call them. Now, I don't understand all that. I don't know how you set those things up, but that's what it's for. She plays sports in high school, and so if she needs to call home, she can call home. Uh, if there's an emergency, she can call home. If she doesn't have internet on it, she doesn't have uh, anything else on it. And just to make sure, they check it all the time, constantly. They look at it, they see what the histories are, they see what's what and what's here and what's there and, and all those different things that parents can monitor and should. Now, does that monitoring prevent any problems? No, it doesn't prevent every problem, I'll put it that way. But it prevents a lot of them. When our children were coming up, we didn't have all that technology. I'm kind of glad we didn't. But you know one thing our kids knew? That any time, night or day, Mom and dad could walk into their room, open their desk drawer, inspect the room. We could do that physically. Why can't we do it technologically? 
There are, there are systems that you can put on phones and computers and iPads, and if internet access is, access is available, it can tell you every site they've gone to. And some people will say, well, yeah, but they know how to disable it. Well, the one we use here at church is Covenant Eyes. If you disable it, the people that get my Covenant Eyes report, it will say on the report that during these times, it was disconnected. And so they can say, why was it disconnected during that time? We need to monitor these things. And if we don't, again, we're opening our children up to a floodgate of problems. The third one we see here is asking questions. Where are you going? What are you going to be doing there? Who will you be with? Ask questions. Well, a bunch of us are going here. Who's a bunch of us? Who are they? How are you getting there? What are you going to do when you get there? I want planned details. When Evan and Natalie were working at the Wilds together and they were already engaged, and Evan called me one day and he said, Dad, he said, would you be all right if Natalie and I on Saturday like drove together into Brevard to go to Walmart or something like that? I said, I'm fine with that. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to promise me that before you leave, you tell somebody exactly where you're going and don't go anywhere else. And so if you say we're going to Walmart, and then as you leave Walmart, you decide to stop and get a milkshake, then call the camp and tell them, listen, we were coming right back, but we're stopping here to get a milkshake. That accountability, that monitoring, that asking questions that parents should do. Where's your child tonight? Well, they went out with some friends. Where'd they go? Well, I'm not real sure where they were going. Whoa. We might as well put a rattlesnake in their bed. Don't be afraid to ask questions of where are you going and what are you going to be doing while you're there and who's going to be there? What parents are going to be there? You know, I'm going over to my friend's house tonight. Will their parents be there? And that's something to incorporate in our children at the youngest of ages. Monitoring language. We put a quote up here. The tongue is a window to the soul. Know what they're saying. And sometimes, folks, find out what it means. Find out what it means. Because terms and slang terms and things off of television, they change constantly. So don't be the kind of parent that your child is talking about something and you say, ah, they might as well be talking Greek. I don't understand what they're saying. Find out what they're saying. Ask them if they don't give you a satisfactory answer, if they do give you a satisfactory answer. That's one of the wonderful things about technology. You can Google anything. And so your child's constantly using a slang term, you don't know what it means, look it up. Look it up. And you might want to sit down when you look it up. But look it up. Find out what it means. And deal with it. And if you have to confront them over that, confront them over that. They talk about television programs. They, 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 they talk about all kinds of things. Find out what they're talking about. Take that kind of involvement, that kind of monitoring. When we were in Pittsburgh and I had a Christian school, and this was back in the late 90s, and I had overheard kids at school talking about watching a particular comedy that was on at that time. Uh, honestly, to this day, I've never seen it. But one thing I used to do back then when I was working more closely with young people was I would read the TV directory. I wanted to know what the shows were. I wanted to know what they were about. So if I heard somebody talking about them, I had an idea what they were talking about. It was a Wednesday night like this one. And we were talking about some of these same things. And I, I said to the parents that night, I said, uh, I said, you know, I hear a lot of your children talking about watching this particular show. I said, now let's be honest tonight. How many of you here, your children watches this show every week? And probably two-thirds of them raised their hand. They had teenagers, and two-thirds of them raised their hand. And I said, okay, there are no children here. I wouldn't do this tonight, but I, there are no children in here. I want to read to you what that program was about this past week. 
what the subject matter was. This was probably 1998, 1999. I mean, we're going back almost 25 years ago. And when I read that, parents had their jaws down to here. They had no idea because they weren't monitoring it. They weren't paying attention to it. And they foolishly had the idea that, well, everybody watches that. This doesn't make it right. These are all things that lead to a child rejecting the things of God. Moving on, dress. I know we talk about this a lot, but folks, unfortunately we have to. But dad and mom, you are in charge. Teach your children to dress appropriately, modestly, and in a way that glorifies God and not self. And teach them why. Teach them that modesty doesn't just mean a certain length. but Teach them what modesty is. And why the type of clothing that we wear reflects a modest or an immodest mindset. Appropriately. I realize I'm getting up there. But I can remember when people... Now, some of it, I'm glad we don't do this anymore. My, my grandfather, my grandfather and grandmother came to our house every Sunday afternoon. They came to our house for dinner. My grandfather was a steel worker. Been a steel worker all his life. And when they would come to our house on Sunday afternoon, he'd wear a tie. When they came for a birthday party, he'd wear a tie. Now, I'm glad we don't do that anymore, as you can see. Okay? But there is such a thing as appropriateness. How many of you have flown within the last year or so? How many of you have noticed people in the airport or getting on your plane basically wearing pajamas? Okay. Grocery store, you're right. That's just not appropriate. Is that part of our testimony? It should be. Well, but it's comfortable. Now, you know a young lady that, that didn't want to go to a Christian college because I don't like to wear dresses. So she got a job and has to wear a uniform. And the fact is, if she doesn't wear the, want to wear the uniform, she doesn't have the job. There's an appropriateness that they need to learn. They need to learn that we, what we do on the outside is aimed at glorifying God. And people will often say, well, it doesn't matter what I do because God looks on the heart. But you know what? The world can't see the heart. They only see the outside. And everything we do ought to be done to the glory of God. And when we say not to self, it means that, that we're not trying to dress in such a way that draws gross attention to ourselves. This is not a reflection on anything. I can go into that another time. But years ago, when Harry Truman was the President of the United States and Billy Graham was up and coming, Billy Graham was known for wearing flashy suits and loud ties. Now, if you saw him later on, that's kind of hard to envision, but but he would wear white double-breasted suits and bright flowered ties and so on and so forth. And he, he actually had a meeting, he and a couple of his men had a meeting with President Truman. And so they walked in in all their loud, garish clothing. And Truman thought they were a bunch of nuts. Now, was Truman right about that? Well, you know, we can debate that. But, but it was what they were wearing that, that brought attention to themselves didn't glorify God. And there were other events that happened in that same circumstance that, that created some real problems with Truman on that. But, but that idea that I'm going to dress in such a way that everybody sees me okay, rather than glorifying God. Are we not to do all to the glory of God? So every one of these aspects, and, and again, a key to this, teach your children why. Teach them why. This is why we do this. This is why we don't do this. Are we saying that everybody that does this is wicked and hellbound? No. Are we saying that everybody that doesn't do this is righteous and holy? No. But this is why we do and this is why we don't. And I understand that that's age relevant. You don't sit down with a four-year-old and try to talk them through a philosophical point on things such as that. But teach our children the whys of things. 
The next thing that we see here, there's a, oftentimes a yielding of parental responsibilities. We'll not turn to these verses. You're familiar with them. Deuteronomy talks. That's the verses that talk about these things you'll teach unto your children. You'll talk about them in your house and when you're sitting down and standing up and lying down and sitting down. And, and you'll teach them diligently unto your children. In Ephesians 6, 4, which we've already cited, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the, of the Lord. That, but there's a yielding sometimes. And, and again, it's a, it's a well-intentioned yielding sometimes. But this is where it becomes dangerous. Don't yield that responsibility to the school. Christian schools are not to raise the child. That's not their job. But there are parents who look and they'll say, you know what, we did everything right. We, we had them in a Christian school. We had them in youth group. We had them in Sunday school. We did all the right things in that regard. But what we've done oftentimes is we've yielded the responsibility that's ours. When I had Christian schools, I, I used to tell parents that were looking at coming, I used to tell them, I want you to understand something. God only gave me two children to raise. And they ain't yours. <laughs> he only gave me two children to raise. We're here to help you, to aid you. But don't think, well, we've given our children over to the Christian school, and therefore everything is going to be all right. Certainly secular schools, they have a clear and stated agenda to change society. We cite here Proverbs 19.27, which I think is really a key verse in the terms of education. And what it says is, Cease my son to hear instruction, which causes us to err from the words of knowledge. But we've known Christian families, Christian parents, who have turned their children over to the school in a shirking of the responsibilities, but also turned them over because if they go to the school, they're, they're a good athlete, they can get a scholarship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And our priorities get out of whack as well. But here's the catch. Ultimately, children become wayward because they're sinners. Children become wayward because they're sinners. With the contributing factors listed above, the door to exercising that sin nature often is left wide open. The major role of parenting is to keep that door shut. I can remember years ago people saying, and they said it about us, they said it about our children, they said it about kids in Christian school, kids that were in church all the time, and they used to refer to it as the hot house. Well, you know what? They're in a hot house. They, they, they're protected. They can't, they, can't, uh, they can't function in the elements, and they're in a hot house. And the retort, and I heard this. I didn't come up with this on my own. I wish I had, but the retort that I had heard and therefore I normally gave. If I was talking to a man and I said, if you're going to give your wife a dozen roses, where are you going to get those roses? And he'd say, well, I don't I'd say, are you going to go out on a hillside where those roses have been beaten with hailstorms and, and blown with the wind and try to find some there that aren't too bad and give your wife a dozen roses? Or are you going to go someplace where they've grown them in a protected situation and they have the full beauty that they're supposed to have and that's what you're going to give your wife? Well, the answer is obvious. Well, not always, because some guys said, I don't give my wife flowers. <laughs> so, but that was a whole different issue. But, but, but the idea of protecting our children and guiding our children and guarding our children and asking God to put a hedge about our children, but oftentimes we're the hedge. But again, sadly, sometimes we can cross every T and dot every I. And our children still do wrong because they're sinners. And sometimes they can still do wrong because they've never trusted Christ as their Savior. And sometimes they still do wrong because we're erroneously trying to make sure that on the outside they cross every T and dot every I. But we've not done, dealt effectively with the heart. And so true, many, 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 if not most, wayward children out of Christians' homes, first and foremost, for, first and foremost need to be saved. But there are times when those that can give a clear testimony of salvation 
still struggle with sin. I personally, and you could argue with this if you wanted to, I wouldn't spend the time to argue with you. I personally believe that Ananias and Sapphira were saved. And yet their sin was such that God took them home early. I personally believe that. I know some don't, and that's fine. That's fine. When you get to heaven and you see me talking to him, you'll understand that. But sometimes that happens. But these are issues as to the whys and how did this happen. And it's not a case of us looking and saying, Phew, man, I blew that. It's all over with. Because that's the last thing we have here and you have it on your sheet. There is hope. There is hope. The prodigal wayward son came home. He came home. Again, in our opening text, he returned. It's not just waiting for that to happen. There are steps that are essential in seeking to see that wayward come back, to see them return. Sadly, sometimes they never do. And that's tragic. Sometimes they never do. But don't give up. To give up is to give up on God. And it's giving up on God's power to change lives. Next week we will talk about what do we do now. And here are some steps that we can take, that we should be taking if we're dealing with a wayward child. But don't give up. And again, if you look at a list like we looked at tonight and you say, whoa, man, that was me. Well, just like anything else, we confess it, we forsake it, we live it with God, and we ask God to give us the strength to do better with it and to make it right as best we can. And that may mean, and we'll talk about this more next week, that may mean we sit down with our child and we say, you know, in these areas, I failed you. Please forgive me. And don't give them the opportunity to say, well, Mom, Dad, they're too stubborn to admit when they were wrong. Admit when you're wrong. Admit it now. You know, when you're raising your children and you, you say something wrongly, sit down with that child and say, please forgive me. I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have done that or I responded wrongly. And let them, let them see Christ in all of that. Okay? Next week, that's what we'll look at. Yes, John. Oh, I'm sorry. B. Go, go back to D or B? D. E. Make a symbol. You're making an O. It's not an O. A D? 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 Okay. D is in delinquent? Okay. Probably not a good reference, but... All right. One more. Don't yield to the church, the Sunday school, the junior church, the teen group, camps, etc. As we said, I think we did say this, that the role is to help, not to replace the parents. And so don't yield the responsibility and think, well, they've been in church, they've been in Sunday school, they've been in junior church, teen group, they've gone to camp, they've done all these things because the role is to help and to supplement and to reinforce, uh, not to replace the parents, okay? Okay. That should be F. Hmm. Okay. Is there something else I missed? This one? Okay. That's F. No, I'm getting an F. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> See, that's, a, that's the problem with technology. That's <laughs> so, everybody got everything now? No? You didn't get this yet. It's not there. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so it is... Yeah, but my, my letters are different because when it prints, it jumps. So we've got, ultimately, 
So it's following this before this. Okay. After that one. Okay. So yielding and then sin and inconsistency in the parents' lives. Okay. Sin and inconsistency in the parents' lives. Okay. We got it all? hoop de doo All right. Father, thank you for the time tonight. Thank you for the time to look at these things, and I pray that you would teach us, encourage us. I pray for those that are raising children right now, and I pray that you'd give them wisdom and uh, and courage. It's not an easy task uh, for those of us who have raised our children, and we see things that sadness, perhaps give us heartache, Again, help us not to give up on you, such we don't give up on them. And I pray, Father, then as you work, that you would be glorified through it all. Thank you again for this time tonight.